In this video, we're going to learn how some new extraction instruments designed by Carl Schumacher Instruments allow for the atraumatic extraction of teeth with the preservation of alveolar bone and gingival architecture. Surgical procedures, just like anything else we do in dentistry or really in life, require some planning to do it right. When we plan for surgery, we need to mentally walk through the procedure step by step so that we know what we need to do to get to the desired result. And if we know all the steps we need to go through, then we also know what instruments we're going to need or may potentially need in order to successfully perform the procedure. And we all know, after doing this long enough, that having the right instruments for the procedure makes your life significantly easier. The time-honored techniques of exodontia have always emphasized the use of forceps for most of the work of tooth removal. We're all familiar with the complications of forceps extraction, including fracture of the tooth or adjacent bone, which may then require elevation of a surgical flap and removal of bone in order to complete the procedure. Especially when dental implants are planned for the extraction sites in the anterior aesthetic zone of the mouth, this can have detrimental effects on the final aesthetic and functional results. A new design of exodontia instruments has been introduced that modifies the surgical procedure in order to minimize trauma to the extraction site. These instruments include peritomes and proximators, which loosen the tooth within the alveolus, and apical retention forceps, which grasp the root in order to ease it out of the socket. Traditional teaching of exodontia has involved using dental elevators and forceps to luxate the tooth within the alveolus. The cardinal movements of luxation are dictated by the number and the shape of the roots of the tooth to be removed, as well as the thickness of the surrounding bone. Luxation is intended to stretch and tear the fibers of the periodontal ligaments and to expand the alveolus. Apical pressure on the tooth is also used in order to facilitate socket expansion. Straight dental elevators are placed perpendicular to the tooth and used to push it away or lift it occlusally within the socket. Although tooth elevation is intended to be from interproximal bone to the target tooth, it's frequently difficult to avoid contact of the elevator with the adjacent tooth, especially if there's crowding or malposition. If this tooth has an intact coronal structure, there's generally no injury. However, if the adjacent tooth has a large restoration, special care must be taken to avoid damaging the restoration or fracturing the weakened tooth structure. With the standard dental forceps, significant forces must sometimes be applied to the tooth to expand the socket and to sever the periodontal ligament fibers. If the forceps cannot be placed far enough apically, then this can lead to fracture of the tooth crown in the forceps before delivery of the intact root. If the root fracture is near or below the bony crest, then a surgical burr is required in order to remove periradicular bone, sever the periodontal ligament, and to provide a purchase point for root elevation. If this occurs in a site that's intended to support a dental implant, the bone volume and morphology and the gingival architecture are compromised. In the aesthetic zone, this can cause a significant cosmetic problem. The practice of exodontia underwent a dramatic change in the 1970s with the introduction of the surgical handpiece. Prior to that, Mallet and chisel were used to remove bone in order to get surgical exposure of impacted teeth and to section their roots in order to facilitate the removal. This was a slow and traumatic process for the patient and was one of the reasons that prophylactic removal of teeth, especially third molars, was rarely done. Severely decayed, ankylosed, and multi-rooted teeth were also removed using the same technique. Today, the high-speed, high-torque surgical drill is the instrument of choice for these tasks. Other than this advance, the instruments and techniques used in the removal of teeth have remained essentially unchanged for the last century. The latest revolution in dentistry has been the advancement of dental implants into mainstream practice. Especially when we're dealing with the anterior aesthetic zone of the mouth, this has completely changed our concepts about preservation of compromised teeth, and as a result of that, maintenance and preservation of bone and soft tissue levels. We're now very conscious about the management of bone and gingiva around dental extraction sites so that the natural architecture is maintained around a subsequently placed dental implant and restoration. Because of this, new instruments have been developed to facilitate the atraumatic extraction of both anterior and and multi-rooted teeth. These instruments exploit new biomechanical concepts in the practice of exodontia. Traditional extraction techniques utilize the dental elevator as the initial instrument to slightly loosen the tooth. The primary instrument which removes the tooth is the extraction forceps. A new approach to exodontia emphasizes atraumatic expansion of the alveolar bone and disruption of the periodontal ligament attachment of the tooth to the bone as the primary focus. The forceps is then used to gently lift the root out of the expanded socket. For the removal of multi-rooted teeth, the crown and roots are sectioned using a surgical handpiece by the standard technique. Once the roots have been separated, they can be removed by the atraumatic techniques described here. In 1999, a new type of instrument called the periotome was introduced. This instrument is designed to sever the periodontal ligament attachment of the tooth to the alveolar bone. 
It's advanced down the periodontal ligament space around the entire circumference of the tooth as apically as possible. Periotomes are available in a variety of designs. The number one periotome, which is the top image here, combines the straight ligament cutting blade on one end with a socket expander on the other. The periotome number two, which is the bottom image, combines two ligament cutting blades which are contra-angled to each other in order to access the mesial and distal regions of the root. The periotome blade is a thin end cutting instrument. It's generally about a half millimeter thick and about two millimeters wide. The peritone blade is positioned along the long axis of the root between the root and the alveolar bone. The entire cutting action takes place at the sharpened, rounded end of the peritone blade. The peritone blade is angled toward the root apex and apical pressure is applied to it. A gentle rocking motion is applied to the handle and this allows the tip of the peritone blade to be reinserted more apically with each subsequent pass, severing the periodontal ligament attachment of the tooth as completely as possible. A prying motion, as is done with elevators, should never be used in a direction perpendicular to the root. Prying motions can lead to fracture of the peritome. Only the leading edge of the peritome blade is used to cut the periodontal ligament fibers. In other words, the blade does not cut laterally. Rather, the blade is inserted and rocked in an axis that's parallel to the periodontal ligament space. Severing the periodontal ligament attachment should be done in every aspect that access around the tooth will allow. It's useful to return for a second deeper application in each area in order to eliminate more apical attachments. Some minimal compression of the surrounding bone results from the insertion of the peritone blade. Additional expansion of the socket can be accomplished with the socket expander peritone blade. Although peritome is often sufficient to relieve the periodontal ligament attachment of a relatively straight root, root curvature or dense bone may limit the degree to which the peritome will enter the periodontal ligament space. In this case, a refinement of the peritome, known as the proximator, will be helpful. I refer to these in my office as the turbo peritomes. Proximators are used where the root anatomy dictates that some expansion of the socket will be necessary in order to facilitate tooth delivery. There are four patterns of proximators. First is the spade proximator, which is the one seen on the far right. There are also straight proximators, which are on the far left, and they come in either a 2.5 millimeter or a 5 millimeter width. Then there are the mesial and distal proximators, which come in both a 2.5 millimeter and a 5 millimeter width. Just like with a periotome, a proximator is placed into the periodontal ligament space and then moved circumferentially around the root. It's advanced with a rocking motion circumferentially around the tooth toward the root apex. The tip of the spade proximator easily enters the periodontal ligament space in order to loosen the fibers, and it also aids in the retraction of the sulcus. The retraction aids in identifying the periodontal ligament space for application of the other proximators. The straight proximator can be used on all aspects of anterior teeth as well as on the labial aspect of premolars and molars. The narrow tip is able to advance subgingively to the very apex of the root structure, severing the periodontal ligament fibers but will not cause a root fracture. The tip of the mesial proximator can advance into the mesial aspect of any anterior or posterior tooth and effectively sever a significant portion of the periodontal ligament fibers very quickly. The angulation of the mesial proximator also allows it to be used on the labial surface of a molar to sever the fibers apical to the furcation. The distal proximator tip can advance into the distal aspect of any anterior or posterior tooth or on the palatal side of a maxillary molar superior to the furcation. These instruments can also be placed into the interproximal spaces in order to create a mesiodistal expansion of the socket. This avoids excessive expansion of the thin labial plate where it's at high risk for fracture, as in the case of the anterior dentition. Proximators can be used to create space for the application of a forceps to what remains of the tooth structure in severely broken down teeth also. Multi-rooted teeth are sectioned with a surgical handpiece in order to create individual roots in a similar fashion to a traditional surgical extraction. The proximators are then used to sever the periodontal ligament attachment of the roots, and the individual roots are then luxated with the proximators. Socket expansion with the proximator is accomplished by a luxation of the root with a slight wheel and axle motion. This expansion eliminates the mechanical retentive factor in the alveolar bone that's created by the root curvature and facilitates easy removal. As the proximator tip is advanced toward the root apex, the periodontal ligament attachment is disrupted and progressive displacement of the root causes occlusal movement of the tooth. The tooth prepared in this way is easily removed from the socket with a forceps using gentle traction. In some cases, use of the proximators mobilizes the tooth to such an extent that it can be removed with only a hemostat. Here you see how I use a spade proximator alone as the only instrument in order to remove a severely broken down root of tooth number 10, which is completely subgingival. I'm going to take a number 15 scalpel blade and cut a thin rim of soft tissue from around uh, what's covering the root so that I can see where it is. And once I've made the incision, I come back with a small hemostat and remove that thin rim of tissue. 
Once I can completely visualize the root, I'm going to look for a place where I can place my spade proximator. Here it's going to be on the palatal aspect where I can advance the instrument into the periodontal ligament space. I'm going to rock it back and forth as I'm advancing it more apically, then come around to the facial and to the distal interproximal and do the same thing. And each time I place the proximator into the periodontal ligament space. I'm advancing it a little further and further apically each time. And again, rocking it back and forth, also giving a little uh, uh, wheel and uh, axle uh, luxation motion. And as I come back to the mesial interproximal, I can advance the proximator tip all the way down to the apex, and that displaces the root completely out of the socket. Using a traditional design forcep, extraction techniques utilize pressure applied in an apical and in a buccal-lingual direction in order to expand the alveolus. This may sometimes result in fracture of the tooth root or the alveolar bone as the tooth is being removed. If a dental implant is planned for the site, then an alveolar bone fracture can result in a ridge defect after healing. If a root tip must be removed, this may sometimes require removal of bone with a burr. In 2001, a new generation of extraction forceps called apical retention forceps became available. These forceps provide a deeper grip around the tooth and root, and they also improve access around crowded teeth and improve visibility. They're designed to make deep, continuous progress into the periodontal ligament space with minimal displacement of the buccal plate and achieve multiple contacts with the root structure. Modification of the forceps design, such as thinner, sharpened beaks, a tapered profile, and longitudinally cut serrations facilitate a more apical placement on the root structure and greater conformity to the true shape of the root, which improves grip and causes less damage to the surrounding tissues. This allows the tooth to be mobilized with less chance of root or alveolar bone fracture. You can see here in this illustration how the thin tapered beaks of the apical retention forceps allow it to grasp the root further apically where it's less likely to fracture the crown off and to get a better purchase. Apical retention forceps come in a variety of configurations. You can see on the far left is the ash pattern followed by a number one, then an upper universal, a lower universal, an upper molar forceps, and a lower molar forceps. Here, an upper universal apical retention forceps is used to remove a maxillary first premolar tooth for orthodontic purposes. You can see that the beaks being very thin and tapered are able to be advanced down underneath the mucosa and as far apically on the tooth as possible, which allows you to get a good purchase and good mechanical advantage in order to luxate the tooth to the buccal and the lingual in order to expand the alveolus and be able to remove the tooth with very little difficulty. You can see here that uh, where the apical retention forceps grabs the tooth is actually further towards the apex than with a standard upper universal forceps. Here's a non-restorable tooth number 11 which is basically broken off subgingively. I'm going to use both a spade proximator to luxate the root and to expand the alveolus and then follow that with an apical retention forcep in order to remove the tooth atraumatically. I don't need to make much of an incision here because you can actually see the root, so I'm going to take my spade proximator and try first at the mesiobuccal line angle area and try to advance the spade tip down the periodontal ligament space and rotate the instrument back and forth to try to get some luxation and expansion of the alveolus. I'm going to come back again on the palatal aspect and do the same into the PDL space and wiggle it back and forth and then come back again to the uh, palatal and again onto the buccal and the mesial and distal interproximals. Each time you do this, you notice that the instrument will go a little bit further down the periodontal ligament space and you'll start to see a little bit more luxation of the tooth, a little bit more movement of the root as you do that. Uh, wheel and axle motion back and forth with the proximator. Once I feel like I've got the root fairly mobilized and the, and the alveolus expanded, then I'm going to uh, put down the proximator and come in with the Schumacher apical retention forceps. Now you can see that the root looks like it's fairly well luxated or, and mobilized within the socket. So take the upper universal forcep and I'm going to apply it onto the root and slide it as far subgingivally onto the surface of the root as I can and when I feel like I've got a pretty good purchase of the root I'm going to use my standard luxation movements to luxate the tooth to the buccal and then back to the palatal to the buccal again to the palatal I'm going to give it a little bit of a figure of eight motion in order to further expand the alveolus and I'll find that uh, without too much effort now that the, I'm able to easily deliver the number 11 root. 
So in conclusion, the goal of preserving an alveolar ridge that will have a dental implant placed should be considered before performing a dental extraction at that site. Then, choosing the best technique to accomplish this task is essential. With the introduction of peritomes, Carl Schumacher approximators, and apical retention forceps, an atraumatic extraction of the diseased teeth can now be achieved, resulting in more predictable ridge maintenance. This facilitates more predictable anesthetic implant and prosthetic reconstruction.